Welcome to Booklust. I'm Nancy Pearl. My guest today at University Bookstore is novelist Stuart Onan. Stuart, thank you so much for oh, coming. Thank you, Nancy. Thanks for having me. I always like to do this disclaimer. I'm a huge fan and have been for many, many years. And in fact, you and I, I met each other, but no reason for you to remember, but I loved Snow Angels, which was your first novel. Uh, and I interviewed you in Tulsa because you were teaching in Oklahoma at a school. Yeah, I was teaching in Edmond at the uh -huh. University of Central Oklahoma. Yes. And I think I went to Tulsa probably for the Oklahoma Book Awards. I think one of my books actually won. It was The Names of the Dead, actually. Oh. My uh, second novel oh. won the Oklahoma Book Award. Uh -huh. But one of the questions I asked you, and we did an interview in front of an audience, and I said, um, because you had just written Snow Angels, it was an American Library Association notable book, and it was just just this fabulous first novel. And I said, "Do you feel like you have to live up to, you know, how good this first novel is? Are you nervous about doing your second novel?" And you said something on the order of, "Nancy, I have so many ideas for books. The question is, <laughs> you know, how I'm going to space them out so that it's not like overwhelming to the reader." Oh, really? Yes. Wow, I, wow. It, uh... Yeah, and then, I mean, sort of then to watch your career sort of take off and, um, and, and just writing these wonderful books, it's just really a pleasure to, to oh, talk to you again. Oh, well, thanks. Well, thanks. And, you know, I, I think now especially, I think you can always write badly. At any moment, you can write really, really badly. Um, and not all the books are going to be good. That's just, it's, it's supposed to be hard, right? Yeah. If, if everybody knew how yeah. to do it, everyone would be doing it all the time. And if, you know, if a writer like Faulkner you know, has five or six bad books, you know, yeah. who am I to, to write all good books? Well, what is your writing process? I mean, how would you know? Yeah, how would you know? You right. don't, you don't, because you get, at least I get too close to the characters. And that's what I'm always sort of striving for is that intimacy with the characters, to know them better than you could ever know anybody in real life and care about them and hoping that the reader will then know and care. Um, but you don't know, sometimes you get too, too close. Do you write a certain number of hours a day, or I mean, is your are you very disciplined? That uh, way? I don't know if I'm disciplined. Um, I'm pretty lazy, but I, I don't have another job, so I, I try to write nine to five uh -huh. when I'm working on something, and just sit there and just learn how to sit there and sit there and be patient, um, and, and sort of be quiet and, and just and just hope that something comes. And by the end of the day, I hope to have one page. One oh. page double space, which is 300 words, which is right. not much. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of sort of sitting around and looking up into the air like, <laughs> and not knowing what to say. And people say, you know, well, you've obviously you've never had writer's block, and that's what I do all day long. Yeah, I right. don't it's, know what the yeah. next sentence is, I don't know what the next wow. word is, I don't know what the next scene is. I have no idea. Um, so you just sit there and you hope it comes. Do you turn off your internet and everything, or? I, I don't have internet with, oh, with, with the, that machi the machine that I work on. Oh, it that's is just, just right. a printer is attached to it. Yeah, it can, it can be very distracting, uh -huh. I think. And, and research can be distracting. And Flannery O'Connor said, you know, the, the, the great sort of um, enemy of the writer is reading. You know, because when you're supposed to be there writing, you'll get up and you'll go grab a book off the shelf and you'll fall into the book uh -huh. and you'll sit down with the book and you know, hours will pass. And so I, I try to sort of be disciplined that way and sort of stay at my desk sit at my machine, as Flannery O'Connor says, and just sort of, you know, grind it out. Push that peanut across the desert, right? Yeah. You know, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Do you reread the previous days every, oh, yeah. every, before you start? Oh, every night. Um, I'll, I'll take what I printed out from that day's work and I'll go over it and I'll revise it. So the next day I'll have some corrections to put in and I'll correct those corrections mm -hmm. and get a little momentum going, just mm -hmm. start. But of course there's that moment where you're like, okay, I got nothing. And that's yeah. and all, and you see, you look at your notebook, and you look at your journal, and you, you know, you've got research sort of up on bulletin boards, and you're like, yeah, okay, where are we going? And, you know, wow. that's right. And Do you frequently get, like, moments of panic that, <laughs> 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 uh, deep anxiety? Um, sometimes, sometimes when you, when you really don't know, when you don't know what your character is all about. I mean, it, you, get, you get interested. Um, I don't know if it's panic, but you say, I need to find out more. I need to know more about this person. Otherwise, I can't really go forward mm -hmm. with the story. Do you know what's going to happen in the books? Do you outline? Or? 
Uh, it depends. It depends on how big the book is. Um, a, a book that runs around 400, 500 pages long, I'll get to a middle point where I'm like, oh, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I'm sort of lost in, a, sort of, you know, in the middle of the ocean. And, and then I have to sort of try to figure my way out and think my way out of it. Whereas in the shorter book, something between, say, 150 and 250, usually you can feel your way out. Mm -hmm. And you know, I haven't really plotting my books lately, as you've probably noticed. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're just sort of these patchworks that's, you know, juxtaposing feelings. So they're mm -hmm. put together almost like sort of collages or emotional collages in a way. And yeah. they follow the, just the regular life of the people as they're living it right. and how they get from day to day, how they endure. Yeah. Um, and that's a much quieter way of writing. It means you're not going to have the huge sort of you know, plotted climaxes that you would with something like a Snow Angels or right. Names of the Dead or right. Speed Queen or something like that. They're not quite as dire. Um, but I think it's the kind of book that I like to read a lot more now. Yeah. Maybe as I'm older, I yeah. guess, I, I tend to go to those writers like uh, William Maxwell and Virginia mm -hmm. Woolf and Alice mm -hmm. Munro, right. um, and who, who, who describe, I guess, life as we live it. You're male, obviously, and yet you write. All male. <laughs> all male, right. And you, but you write with such um, emotional, almost in a way, consonance, not resonance, but consonance about, from a woman's viewpoint or about a woman's life. Does that sort of pureness about that or the truth that your writing gives about those, like Emily in Emily Alone, um, is that because you're a good writer? I mean, how do you do it? I think, I think you get into other characters, whether they're male or female or young or old or, or whatever background they're from, just by trying to understand who they are and, and having empathy with them and you know, doing research, talking with people. I mean, a lot of first-person sources. Right. I mean, I interview a lot of people. Oh, um, you do? Oh, yeah, um, who are in sort of the same you know, situation that my characters mm -hmm. are in. I look at how other people have written about them or uh, done, say, film work or TV work about people in the same situations. What are the cliches of this situation? What are the cliches of, of being this person in this situation? And how do I avoid that? How do I do it differently? You have, mm -hmm. to, you have to do it differently or better. Mm -hmm. If you don't do it differently or better, there's no point doing it because mm -hmm. you're just doing something somebody's already done. There. Um, so I'm always sort of aware of that and, and, and also the selectivity having enough material that you can select the small things that people haven't sort of, you know, turned into cliches mm -hmm. um, and, and try to do it better. But you're, you're always trying to get to the heart of the character. What, you know, what about them do you want to know about how it is to be them? Mm -hmm. How does it feel to be you? That's like the most important question for me in fiction. When I go to it as a reader, that's what I want to find out. How does, how does it feel to go through this experience? How does it feel to be this particular person? Yeah. And if the book can answer that, um, then I think, wow, it's a great book. You know, that has some life to it, right. some, some soul to it. Um, so that's what you try to do. And, and again, I mean, it's not always going to work. It's going to fail sometimes. You're going to have characters that are flat or unbelievable or, or don't connect. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, you know, you got to try, right? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I, think, I think any, any good writer should be able to do it. Um, uh, a lot of people don't try. Mm -hmm. um, they don't try to sort of move beyond their, I guess, their, their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. I, say, I, I, I tell my, my writing students, you know, move away from your strengths. You might find something else that's more interesting because mm -hmm. you know you can do this one thing. Was there a book of yours that was harder to write for that reason, that you felt, you know, you were having a, a more difficult time connecting? For a long time, I couldn't, I couldn't find my way into A Prayer for the Dying. Um, I tried and tried. I, I had this character of Jacob. I knew that he was in the middle of this, all these crazy things happening in this town. Mm -hmm. And I knew that he was somehow touched or damaged or uh, enlivened by some sort of odd spirit um, and, and, and this guilt and this, this weirdness. But I couldn't quite grasp him. I couldn't get to him. And I tried writing the book in the first person. I tried writing the book in the third person. I just couldn't get there. Um, and then luckily I, I, I found the second person uh, which I kind of lifted from um, Robert O'Connor's Buffalo Soldiers. Mm -hmm. Wonderful book, mm -hmm. wonderful book, great writer. Um, and once I got the second person, I began to find a way into the character. And then I said, oh, I see how this works. I see how it, it sort of opens him up, the second person. I mean, and that's always sort of the, the, the ideal is that your form or your structure will sort of, you know, break open the emotional world of the character and bring it across to the reader as powerfully as possible. And usually that's, if you can find that, then you've got something. Um, so yeah. in, in some, t some sense, I guess point of view is the strongest tool, I guess, that the, the fiction writer has. 
Yeah, um, that's and, an interesting and, way of looking and, at it. And, and so when, when in trouble, I, I'll usually go back to POV and I'll say, you know, is this right? You know, how come I'm not feeling this? Mm -hmm. how, how come I'm not getting it? There. You don't write sequels as such, but you... But I did. But you did. I did. Right, yeah. right. So what compelled you to do that? Well, I knew I wasn't done with Emily. Yes. Um, originally, the way that I had conceived Wish You Were Here, once I had found Emily as a character, and it took me forever to find her, um, once I found her as a character, I thought this is going to be a book about her and her alone. Mm -hmm. um, but as I got into Wish You Were Here, I found all these other characters, and it had that sort of, I had the, that Tolstoyan kind of experience where every character seems really interesting, and I really want to follow them everywhere. And, you know, and, and, you know I love Anna Karenina, and he's sort of my first sort of model wow. as a writer. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to write that big, big, baggy book there, and so I did. Um, but I knew that I needed to spend more time with Emily to bring her out further, because I knew that the views that people around her have of her aren't quite right. I think Emily's a little more deeper than that. Um, and everybody, I mean, every first person's unreliable, but you know, even every third person, you know, subjective narrator is unreliable. So the way they looked at Emily wasn't quite true, I thought. And so I figured I sort of owed her, you know, yeah. a full-size book to really sort of go into her and, and get way, way in there and bring her across to the reader. Um, third subjective, I think, is, is that's the really, again, point of view, is the most powerful because you're, you're trapped in this one character. Um, and it can, be, it can be claustrophobic in some sense, or it can be freeing once you realize the depths that people have in them. And I think Emily has great depth oh, to yeah. her. Even though she's, a, she's crotchety and you know, a pain in the ass sometimes, I think she has wonderful depth. Emily alone is just a triumph. Wish you were here, it was okay. great. But Emily alone, I, I think, um, because you just like bring this elderly woman and give us give the readers a gift of 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 knowing about her life and what her experiences oh, are. Oh, thanks, yeah. thanks. It I, was I, just well, it was it's it was great for me because I got to sort of totally <coughs> experience her, and and be both totally generous to her and also merciless because she is tough. Yeah. She is tough on herself. She's tough on the people around her. Yeah. Um, she reminded me um, a little bit. Oh, I'll. Oh yeah, Olive Kitteridge. Olive Kitteridge, yeah. Yeah, Elizabeth yeah. Strout's book. Yeah, she's she's a fine writer, really yeah. nice writer. Yes. Yeah, I like all three of her books. Yeah. actually. Yes. I just I just uh, assigned Abide with Me. Oh, you did um, to my class uh -huh. that I did at this conference. And she's really good, and she's also, and I think like like Emily alone, it, it looks from the outside like it's going to be this sort of you know this nice, polite, small town yes. stuff, right. but at the bottom it's, it's about how people treat one another and some of it can be really tough, yeah. really tough stuff. That's what I kind of, kind of like about her. Emily alone has issues with her children and her grandchildren and, and her sister-in-law, but, but, but Olive Kitteridge is not nice to her husband. <laughs> I mean, really <laughs> not nice to her husband in that first chapter. And so, uh, you know, it's just such an accomplishment, I think, uh, you know, for both you and Elizabeth Strout to to make this make the case for these characters and that there's more to them than what you might see on the outside. Yeah, and that these are characters that aren't really represented very well or very right. seriously, I think, in a lot of our fiction, which is surprising. Yes, I think I think in, in maybe in British fiction there's a little bit more of it dealing with characters who are over say seven. Right there, but right. Uh, again, I. I as with, say, Last Night at the Lobster and Manny there, yeah. here's another person that kind of gets overlooked, even though there are millions of people sort of living that life right. here in America. Right. Um, so to, to treat it with sort of seriousness, you know, and not, not like sort of like grimness and seriousness, but, you know, seriousness and a little bit of humor, too. Um, I don't know. It, it's when, when that happens, you feel like you found the big story. Yeah. Like, like you're like, wow, right. really? Nobody's writing about this? This, is, this territory is all mine? That's great. Yeah. So you have that the great opportunity, and then of course on the other hand you have this responsibility. You know, yeah. you really need to get it right. Did you hear back from people that you interviewed for Emily alone? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, it was weird. Just the other day, I came out of my house and I was I was going to the mailbox, and this woman, she's driving by, she stops, she rolls down the window, she says, "I loved Emily alone. It's great," <laughs> and drives off. And I'm like, this is nuts. Um, yeah, I, I, the best thing that can happen with the book, I think, is the reader comes to it and they bring their family and their life and their feelings to the book and they merge that with the characters. So it's not just my words on the page, it's how they're feeling about 
their sister or their right. aunt or their mother or their grandmother. And because I think in, in the case of Emily especially, everybody has an Emily. Mm -hmm. In the case of the right. lobster, a lot of people say, oh, that's just like the place I work. And I was like, oh, was it you know, a chain restaurant? They're like, no, it was a shoe store, but it was exactly the same. <laughs> you know? So when they come to you and they go, I know these people. You know, This is just like, that means you know, it's that, that collision, the two of you, and you've made something that's much bigger than just a little book. And yeah. Paul Auster actually says when he writes his novels, he leaves room for the reader yeah. because he thinks that, I think that's, he, this is, I'm quoting him pretty close to what he said, but he said because he firmly believes, he's convinced that the reader and the writer write the book together. I think that's true. Yeah. That's true. And that's, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of hands off that way in terms of, you know, making judgments on the characters. The characters can judge one another, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to sort of force the reader into a situation where they say, I have to love this person or I have to, you know, not like this person. In the case of the odds, I mean, a lot of people don't like Marion because she's so sort of bitter because of what has happened. Like, oh, I right. don't like her at all. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, that's entirely your prerogative. Right. You know, I'm, I'm happy that you don't like her because it's, you know, it I'd, I'd, rather, you I'd rather have, you know, you not like her than have me have to say you have to like this person. Yeah. There. Um, and it, it can bite you in the, in the butt, too. I got a, a review once years ago from Snow Angels. A um, person said, I don't know what Mr. Onan wants me to think about these characters. I was like, well, think for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> think for yourself. You have that freedom right. to it. Um, yeah. When you're reading a book, does, is it important to you to like the characters? No, definitely not. Ah, definitely good. not. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, it, it's important for me to understand the characters and try to figure out you know, where they're coming from there. Um, and, and to be a little bit mystified by them and try to figure out you know, why exactly are they doing that. And if I'm satisfied at the end, if I know exactly why they do what they do, um, then I'm satisfied. But I, I, the sympathetic character always having to have sort of the gleaming, shining, triumphant heroes, no, obviously that's not me. Right. Not me at all. And, and I like, I like, you know, I, that, that list of people that I was talking about, Maxwell and Wolf and uh, Monroe and Atwood and Shirley Jackson and Stephen King and Ray Bradbury, you know, all those people, they don't just work with the simple stuff. Everything is com very complicated, uh -huh. very complex. Yeah, I was thinking of Alice Monroe's short stories, that every word, I mean, that she has just, it's like polishing a gem or um, writing a poem, where every word. And yet her work is so much about the accidents of life right. and the, just the weird stuff that happens, the, the crazy yeah. bounces. We have these expectations, and in Alice Monroe, life always sort of confounds our expectations. Yeah. And, and that's, that's, you know, that's what I love about life. That's what I love about right. sort of the great, great fiction. It's not programmatic. It's not schematic. It's not laid out. It's not right. like, okay, this metaphor is going to follow all the way through here. Um, it's, just, it's just what happens. I think that's really the strength of your novels. It is. It's just life. It's what happens. Well, I think it was, it was Forster said, you know, what he didn't like about that approach is this one damn thing after another. <laughs> but that's life, right? I right. Mean, so I, I think in the later books, I'm trying to get a little bit closer and closer to life and the way it feels, even if mm -hmm. I use kind of the, the sort of the fairy tale or, or, or weird setup of the odds. Uh -huh. you know, within that, then I can do the sort of more sort of naturalistic how husbands and wives, especially, you know, long married husbands and right. wives, deal with each other. Your new book is called The Odds, which um, I was thinking it, it would be a good book for book discussion groups because you could probably get a long discussion going on the title alone, <laughs> you know, because I was thinking of all the different ways that you could take that. And all the section headings, the odds yeah, of this, the right. odds of that, yes, and, and, exactly. and how our lives are somehow in an odd way governed by those numbers, yes, yet, right. they're, yet they're not at all. Did you have this book in mind while you were still working on the previous book? No, no, definitely not. No, um, no. Emily, when I finished Emily, I, I, I felt that I, you know, I would sort of done her justice and that idea of being with one person and looking at that situation. Which, you know, how do you live when you're by yourself? How do you endure? How do you get from day to day? And then I wanted to go back and, and after that and go back to, because in, in the earlier books, there's a lot about love. There's a lot about you know love and marriage and how people get along or don't get along. So I wanted to go back to that sort of that, that, that two, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the him and her, the mm -hmm. she and he thing, um, and just talk about marriage and, and love. And, and immediately I just came up with, you know, Valentine's Day and, you know, and, and then the whole setup, I don't know exactly how I got it because it's just kind of goofy. Um, but I, I like that. I like the, just the two points of view and they're, you know, right. they're, they're bound together. Yeah. They are legally yes. bound together. They're bound together by emotion. They're bound together by everything there. And yet, it's not quite working. Are you going to go to Niagara Falls, Buffalo? 
Uh, no, yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. I was there in September. Oh, you were? I was at Bacchanisius College uh -huh. teaching there, which was great. And I had a chance to go back up to uh -huh. Niagara Falls itself. But I, when I was writing the book, I went there twice. I went there in the summer, and then I went there again over Valentine's Day weekend with my wife. And you we did. stayed in the same hotel and did the same things that the characters do, which, of course, is crazily tempting fate, right? Right. You should never do that. But, oh, um, how great. But, but it was, a good it was, story. It was just kind of neat. It was, it, was, it was fun to sort of walk around. It's, it's a really fascinating place. I mean, it, it's kind of... We think of it as sort of this tamed place because of all the sort of the kitsch that's all right. around it. But I mean, just the natural power of it and the beauty of it is, is still there. It, yeah. it still dwarfs everything around it. I mean, even with all the casinos and all the junk there, it's still just the falls. Yeah. I mean, there's something really sort of yeah, special there. Yeah, very powerful. There. Yeah. Yeah. Are you thinking about your next novel? Oh, yes, very much so. And, yes. And working? Or you can't work on these trips. I well, imagine. I've been doing a lot of research, reading a lot. Uh, oh. on these trips um, and taking notes and sort of just getting that, that big head of steam to get ready to go into the, the first sort of section of the book. I need, it's a historical novel. Like my first, oh. my first five books were actually historical novels. Yeah. People now say, oh, he writes about these ripped from the headlines about right. regular people living everyday lives right. right now. It's like completely forgot my first five books there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm doing a lot of period research and trying to come up with um, the tone uh, for the time and the place. And uh, I think I've got, I've got some characters, I've got some events. Um, we'll see. I mean, right now it's, it's that sort of that big yeah. cloud of stuff that just sort of grows and grows and grows. And I've got to find a way in. I've got to find a point of view. I've got to think about container and organization. Um, and and that's, that's tough, the container and the organization and the limitation and things like that, um, to do them right. And if you get, I think if you can get those right, then it's a matter of getting to know the character and getting the character right. Mm -hmm. uh, but first, you've got to have the container, and you've got to figure out how it all sort of, as they say, speaks to itself. Why, why is this in here rather than other stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and justifying every single word? Because I've got an editor at, at, at Viking, Josh Kendall, who makes me justify every single word. Really? Every, oh, he's tough in every single punctuation mark, every single thing. Yeah, he's, he's really tough. No, that's the kind of um, editor that people think doesn't exist oh, anymore. Oh, yes. Well, he's the Maxwell Perkins type. There's no yeah. doubt about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's, he's really, really good. Uh, so between the two of us, we're kind of sort of endlessly patient and endlessly perfectionist and trying to get it right without making it sort of squeak or be, mm -hmm. be skimpy mm -hmm. there. Uh, so even in a small book like The Odds, I think there's, I hope, there's some sort of weight and extension to the lives. Yes. Art and Marion really, you know them. I mean, you probably know couples like them, you know, and and just to to be part of their lives over Valentine's Day weekend is just, um, and then learning more about what has been going on before that trip is. I, I think it's, I just I mean, I just think you're a great writer. Oh, thanks, <laughs> thank thank you. That's very kind. I'm very That's very kind. I mean, it's it just I look forward to every one of your books and. You know, some I love and some I like a lot and some I like less than others, but that's what you want. I mean... Yeah, you're not going to like them all. And right. especially I'm doing, I hope I'm doing different things yes. from book to book right. and different right. different ways of attacking the material that, that right. some people are going to like others better yes. than others. Yeah. And, and that's fine. I mean, the, one of the greatest compliments I got was from my mother-in-law. She said, um, I, I gave her A World Away to read, which is a very mm -hmm. slow, very stately, stately book about you know, the, the home front back in 1944. And I said, well, how'd you like it? She goes... I know what I read of it. I liked a lot. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, not everyone's gonna not everyone's gonna stick in there, you know, yeah. and that's fine. But you hope that the people that actually do finish the book will have that full experience and might want to come back and hang out with those characters again. Because uh -huh. I always do. Yeah. I always want to hang out with the characters. I always like, it's like Salinger says. Once yeah. you start remembering, you start missing everybody. Yeah. And I definitely miss Art and Marianne and miss Emily. And, yeah. You know and. And, and yet, they're, they're there in the book, and they're there sort of in my mind, wow. so I can go out and hang out with them again. But, but when I finish a book, I do kind of miss them. Do you yeah. think about when, when you finish a book as a reader or as, as, a, as a writer, do you think about what happens to the, book, to the characters after that last page is turned? Uh, a little bit. A little bit. I mean, I, I, sometimes I'll, I'll be able to see what happens to them down the road. I mean, I, I can see what happens with Art and Marion down the road. Um, but sometimes y you need to sort of end where you end mm -hmm. and say, you know, and in this case, I, w I sort of wanted to give them their little moment mm -hmm. there, you know, even if things don't work out mm -hmm. down the road, rather than, you know, do the full-blown epilogue of taking them home and seeing what happens. And, you know, it's, it's, there's always a right time to just sort of step away and leave them there 
you know. Like a snapshot. Yeah, so you can go back to, or, or uh, to me, it's, it's so much of the, the later work is organized around memory. Uh -huh. What these people would remember about this time. Yeah. You know, ten years from then, they'd remember this moment. And at the end of the odds, certainly that's something art will always remember. Mm -hmm. He'll always remember that moment. Sometimes that memory might be painful right. in the future, but he'll always remember it. I remember um, talking to Russell Banks about the my, sweet my hereafter. My very first teacher. Really? My very first teacher. Well, you probably read and oh, yes. loved this. I hope you loved the sweet hereafter. Oh, yes, of course. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because that seems to me. I mean, come to on, be, a bus, yeah. bus full of kids going into a lake. Right. That's my kind of thing. Exactly. I mean, it's your book. I mean, it's your. That's. It's, talk, talk about unsympathetic yeah. characters. Wow. Oh, I know. I know. Mm. Almost every one of them. Were you always a reader? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. From the very, very beginning. And yeah. even when you were a teen, you, oh, yeah. you didn't... Tons and tons of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I loved... Well, first, I, I started with comic books. Uh -huh. um, and then, uh, as I say in uh, Emily Alone, I dedicated to my mother, who took me to the bookmobile. The bookmobile. Oh, yeah. The bookmobile's there. Wow. That's great. You know, yeah. you go in and you, you get, you know, five, six books and take them home. And um, I loved science fiction and uh, the Tarzan series, Edgar Rice mm -hmm. Burroughs. My husband loves um, those. And, and all the sort of the old World War II adventure novels mm -hmm. where, you know, you're flying a mission over, right. you know, Hanover or whatever. Um, and anything, anything at all that was sort of in the house. And then when I was a teenager, even, even say even 10 or 11 years old, they opened a new branch of the library closer to us in Pittsburgh. And I could walk there and you were allowed to take out 10 things. So every time I walked there, I made sure that I got 10 things. And I'd try to get the biggest yeah. things so that I'd get my money's worth. Right. It's all free. <laughs> and then lug them home. And, uh, but, man, I love the library. And, and always have. And, and I, you know, they say, Willie Sutton, they asked him, you know, why do you rob banks? And he said, that's because that's where the money is. And people say, yeah. why do you love the library? That's where the books are. Yeah. You know, even, even more so now. I think uh -huh. you know, now with with the, the sort of the demise of the, of the big box stores, mm -hmm. uh, people are going back to the library, and especially with the economic crunch, you know, people are going right. back to the library. We just got to make sure that we continue to support them somehow. Do you enjoy? I, I'm, I'm assuming that you really enjoy the teaching that you do. Oh yeah. Uh, and, oh yeah. And what why what is what excites you about it? Um, basically, it, probably what excites people about librarians or booksellers, it's getting really great books into people's hands so they can experience them and they can sort of like bring their life in and, and match it up with William Maxwell or Virginia Woolf. Oh, you've, you've never read So Long, See Tomorrow? Yeah. Here, you're in for a great, great treat. You know, I go back and I reread So Long, See Tomorrow, mm -hmm. you know, obsessively or to the lighthouse obsessively. But imagine if you'd never run into that book ever and then suddenly there it is and there's yes. that moment where the first time you read it, it may not click with you, but there's going to be a moment when if you give yourself to the book, it's going to click and it's going to completely illuminate your life and the world. And it, that's that, that exciting feeling, that sort of ecstatic feeling where, you, you know, you know how when you finish a great book and you, yeah. and you close it and you're like, ah, that's a great book. Yeah. You know, I can't wait to give it to someone. I can't wait to read it again. And, right. and, and teaching lets you do both of those. It yes. lets you reread the book that you love and give it to other people who hopefully down the road will give it to other people too. And, say, and Look. keep it alive. And keep it alive. And because and mm -hmm. there it is. To, to get life between covers, impossible. Yeah. And, yet, and yet there it is. And then, yeah. Yeah. Well, Stuart Onan, thank you so much for coming to the bookstore today to talk to oh, us. Oh, a thrill, a thrill. And I'm going to buy some used books, I have a feeling. Oh, good, good. Well, I'm going to buy your book. Thank you so much. Oh, a pleasure. <laughs> a great pleasure.